week we spoke about uh, the supernatural um, and we spoke about the supernatural and how Jesus walked in the supernatural. And we spoke according to Acts 10 verse 38 and it says that the Father anointed Jesus of Nazareth, his son, with the Holy Spirit. And when he anointed him with the Holy Spirit, he went out healing the sick, delivering the <laughs> oppressed. Hallelujah. Amen. So wherever Jesus went. So we spoke about also the fact is that wherever Jesus went, he didn't come to just, you know, temporarily fix things. He came to permanently fix things. When he was dealing with sickness, he didn't come along with a Panadol or an aspirin to say, oh, here, I have this, it'll make you feel better. No, he came to eliminate Hallelujah. sickness. Hallelujah. When he was dealing with demonic spirits, he didn't say, okay, just settle down, have fun, I'll feed you some candy. No, he came to terminate them. He was the terminator of demonic spirits. Hallelujah. And he says, I've given you this authority. But the other aspect of Jesus' ministry was that he went around preaching the gospel. He preached the kingdom of God. And when he preached the kingdom of God, signs followed him. He healed the sick and he delivered the oppressed. Hallelujah. So that same power, he said, he is given unto us. But I want you to understand something today. Because when we look at the book of Mark in chapter 1, we see from here, we see that Mark has a short intro uh, to Jesus' uh, ministry that is established. He's gone into the desert. The Holy Spirit came upon him after the baptism. He's gone into the desert for 40 days. He's come back from there. He started to minister. He saw, you know, uh, 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 Peter and, and, and Simon and so forth at the Sea of Galilee. He calls them to come to follow him. Hallelujah. But then we see, according to verse 22, it says... Or verse 21, it says that he went to the synagogue and he preached. He declared the word of God. But let's look at this. In verse 22, it says, And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now, for me, this came as a rhema word for me because I thought to myself, well, hang on a minute. The word of God was declared from the synagogues. The word of God was declared from the temples. But all of a sudden, Jesus comes along, and he is reading the Word of God, but there is something different between him and the scribe, because the scribe would just read the Word of God, but they didn't carry the weight of what the rabbi would, the teacher would, and have the authority. So all of a sudden, someone's coming with authority to declare the Word of God, and not only fulfilling prophecy, as what he did, when he was declaring Isaiah 60 and Isaiah 61, when he says, this is the good news that I have come to set the captives free. Now, when he was doing these things, they were astonished. And they said, wow, we've never seen that before. Because as them, they saw that he had authority, not as the scribes, but Jesus had a direct, he had a personal forceful teaching that was foreign to any of them had ever heard before. See, when we have a personal relationship with the Word of God, which is Jesus Christ, we will also have an authority when we're preaching, which I believe is something that is lacking in the church today. Right. We have a lot of entertainment, but we don't see someone declaring the Word with an authority to have control over every demonic spirit, to have control over every sickness. Hallelujah. So he spoke with authority. They were surprised. But he not only backed it up with an authority in his speech, in his preaching, but it was backed with signs and wonders. Now, the Bible tells us in the book of Titus, verse 2, verse 15, it says, chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, and let no one despise you. So God has given us a mandate to preach, to teach the Word of God, to rebuke. The Word of God is like a two-edged sword. Now, someone described it like this. The Word of God can be like a sword in one hand and like trying to balance a baby in the other. Because obviously a sword can do a lot of damage. So what we need to do is we need to understand the balance. And that's why when I look at Jude, 
It's very good because it says, according to verse 20 onwards, it says, build yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. It says, keep yourself in the love of God, show compassion on some, and others save from the fire. So when we preach the word of God, it's like a sword. So we also have to balance it to know what to preach at the right hour, at the right time. And that's what people need to hear today. They need to hear a word in season. When you receive a word in season, it brings deliverance to you. It will also bring deliverance to your family. It will also bring deliverance to your marriage. It will also bring deliverance to your children because that's what God does. He doesn't just come to put a band-aid over your soul. He doesn't just come to give you an aspirin or a Panadol for your headache, but He comes to deliver you and holistically do it completely. Hallelujah. So that's what we see with the ministry according According to Matthew 4, verse 23, it says that he also went to the synagogues, preached the kingdom of God, he came to heal, and he came to deliver. Can you see there are three aspects of it? Preaching, healing, and deliverance. Hallelujah. So that same sign that we saw last week that we focused about was the supernatural signs that were present to Jesus' ministry, but it was also, we were emphasizing a little bit more about the preaching of the gospel. So we can see that the evidence of the preaching of the gospel was that healing, signs and wonders, and also deliverance was very present. So that's what I like to say. That's why I said, as of last week, my new name, many people may see me as an actor in the movie Terminator, but I've now nicknamed myself a Terminator for God. I'm terminating demonic strongholds in people's lives. That's my name. That's my Terminator. In actual fact, I used to do full contact fighting and used to have to have a nickname, you know, and mine was like Terminator. That was actually what I used to do as my fighting name was Terminator. So now, according to the spiritual realm, that's what we've been given. We've been given an assignment to terminate demonic uh, legal rights against the saints to bring them into captivity. So we're going to look at that today. We're going to look at that authority. So as we as believers, are we challenged today? To know, and looking at the state of the church that we see today, we see big churches. There is one Perth, one Perth in church here alone that has a big name. In two weeks, it had 2,000 members. But the power of God is not there to deliver the oppressed and heal the sick. So you are telling me there is a missing ingredient. So Jesus came along. Just like it was then. He preached with an authority. They were astonished. And they said, who is this guy? He's preaching with an authority that the scribe does not preach. We haven't heard this before. And so it is today in the church of Jesus Christ. As I travel the nations, God is raising up people that will walk in authority and understand the calling of God upon their lives. Hallelujah. Because that's what God has given to us. He's given us that authority to preach the gospel. So let's look at this. According to Matthew 4, verse 19, it says, Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you what? I will make you fishers of men. So the fishers of men is what? Instead of catching fish, Peter is now encouraged, and those with him, to, as the Lord's invitation, was to learn to catch people by using the net of salvation and rescuing them from the sea of sin. And so it is. Each person, when there is a call of God upon your life, as it was with myself, all of a sudden God is saying, hey, I don't want you to be in business. I don't want you to be in business operations, Robert. Now I don't want you to manage people. Now I want you to go and reach the souls of the lost. So it's the same type of calling. God's saying, come and follow me. Whenever there's a calling on our lives, God will say, come and follow me. But there is a progressive period to that calling. First, is the calling, then the commissioning, and then the sending. So, so it was with the disciples. They were called, but then they had to spend time with Him. They had to be commissioned by the Holy Spirit. They had to be taught by Jesus Christ. They had to be given authority. And then they were sent out. Hallelujah. And so it is with us. In 1 Peter 2.21, we see, For to this you were called... 
Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow His steps. So that's kind of a high expectation for the church, that we should follow His steps. We should follow His example. So what Jesus did, we should also replicate and also see within our ministries, within what God has called us to do. So to follow His steps, clearly we are to consider Christ as our pattern for living as well as our pattern for ministry. Live as He lived and did as He did or do as He did. Hallelujah. 1 John 2, 6. It says, He says, He who says He abides in Him ought Himself also to walk just as He walked. So it doesn't mean just in your character. But it also means to walk in authority. It also means to walk in power. So if he said it in his word, then it is sure that he is also meaning the same thing today. But the problem is that we have today is we're still trying to work out, did God say what he really said? And that's what we see today. We've got so many Bible translations. We have so many applications of our phone. There are so many different Bible apps. There are so many different CDs. There are so many things on your computer. But do we actually believe what God said? But then when you go to third world countries, you see they believe what God says and they're out there doing it. But we're still saying, well, God, did God really say that? I'm not sure. I'm going to sit on this. I'm going to meditate on this. And then no one does anything. Hallelujah. So it's time for God to start to raise up something within the believer. So let's look at this. According to John 14, 12, we see in these words that Jesus spoke to his followers. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these will he do because I go to my father. Now, I can clearly see here that we see, okay, the works that I did. When we look at this passage, Christ was making a direct reference to his ministry activities. Those things which he did to touch the lives of those who he came in contact with on a daily basis. Now, I can tell you, with the way technology is today, we are reaching more people than we've ever been able to reach before. Hallelujah. So don't, you can't, looks can be deceiving. You know, like there are so many people contacting me on a daily basis, which sometimes drives my wife a little bit crazy. But the fact is, there are people, because each, someone that's in America today is at a different timeline to us. Someone in South Africa at the moment is in a different timeline to us. Someone in Asia, someone in Europe is at a different timeline to us. So therefore, when people know the anointing of God is upon your life, they will be contacting you at every hour of the day because they are looking for those that also walked in the footprints of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. They are hungry. Amen. And I say to myself, why don't you go to your pastor? But their pastors are not moving in deliverance. Yeah. They don't understand authority. No one knows how to cast out a devil. Yeah. No one knows about generational curses. Right. No one knows right. about these basic things that yeah. Jesus Christ gave in his word. But today we go to Bible college and what do we do? We come up puffed up but there's no evidence of what we learned in that Bible college. So something is wrong today. So he said, so what peaks of interest comes out from this verse? It is greater works than we will do than Jesus. How can we do that? Only through the Holy Spirit. He said, I will go that I will send you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been sent to his church to empower them. So let's look at this. The strong presentation that Christ gives here. In Matthew 16, we see, according to 17, 18, and these signs will follow them that believe. In my name, they will cast out devils. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink deadly things, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. There is an expectation. The expectations are high, therefore, for the church. And the mandate is clear that men and women of faith are people of action. 
But today, I see a lot of people that are all talk with no action. They even may have written 10 books, but show me the proof in your actions. And that's what we need today. We need to be so dissatisfied that we say, God, I'm not happy. We need more. So therefore, it requires us to meditate on these scriptures, to say, God, why is it today we are not seeing the things that we saw or we read about according to the scripture? Hallelujah. So let's look at this. So when we see that the gospel is to be declared and demonstrated for all to see and hear, the responsibility of this type of ministry has been laid upon our shoulders as the followers of Christ. Therefore, if you say you're a Christian, you should be able to demonstrate being a Christian. And we said last week in the beginning church, you know, after the period of time of those apostles, it was difficult to come to a church. If you were to go to an underground church because it was underground, you had to prove that you were a Christian. And they would say, okay, let's go to the hospital and let's pray for the sick. And if you didn't produce your Christianity, they never took you to the service. Imagine that today. If they said to you, okay, you're going to come and see Pastor Robert, but if you really want to come, you must go to the hospital first. We must pray for the sick. And if they didn't see the demonstration of the Holy Spirit, they wouldn't invite you because there were spies that were sent to try to bring down the church because it was persecuted. So let's look at this. So probably no one adds, adds more emphasis of preaching the gospel among the demonstration of signs and wonders as we see with Paul's ministry. So let's look at Paul. So in 1 Corinthians 2 verses 4 to 5 and he says, and my speech and my preaching were not persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm seeing a lot of persuasive words, persuasive catchphrase. Whatever the man of God says, we are saying that more than what the Word of God says. And now we see that we have apologetics that's coming to the church. And there can be a need for apologetics in some areas. But I believe it's replaced the existence of the Holy Spirit. So all of a sudden, we are now apologetic about why God doesn't do what He says He said He was going to do. That's right. yes, yes. So we're seeing that today according to Romans 15 <laughs> verses 18 to 19. It says, according to the word, it, we, we'll just go through, skim through, it says, In mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, I have fully preached the gospel. So when he fully preached, the preaching of the gospel is also backed up with the signs. That's why he says, I have fully preached the gospel. The preaching of the gospel should also be with the signs and wonders that Jesus is spoken about and also is transferred over to the apostles and the disciples of Jesus Christ. So when he said fully preach, in Paul's eyes, effective preaching required that people encounter God and not just hear about God. People need to encounter this tangible God. Now, when I go overseas and I see missionaries coming from the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witness or the Seven Day Adventists, whatever they say that they are, I say to them, okay, so the last house you went to, were you able to demonstrate the power of the God you're representing? Oh, no, well, we, we just talk about the things that, that happened before. And I said, well, that would be depressing. I would have packed up and left ages ago if I was you because I go with an expectation that when I go into the house whatever that problem is is going to be eliminated yes. we don't come to bring Panadol as it was in yes. one nation they yes. thought the missionaries were coming with medicine so everybody came to the church and I said hallelujah there will be no medicine today but the God I serve will eliminate the sickness within your life Amen. and that's what's happening in the church Missionaries are coming to what? Alleviate the pain, not eliminate the pain. 
And that's why when I was in India, they had this conference and they were discussing maybe we should pay the missionaries like we do professional people that we can invite more missionaries to do the work of God. And I said, if you do that, you're not going to do it with faith and you won't do it with a demonstration of power. So therefore, what do we have? We have a watered down gospel. So when the gospel's watered down, it changes the definition. It's not demonstrated with power. And it's not the preaching of the simplicity of the cross. That's why anybody could do it. That's why fishermen, that's why anybody that spent time with Jesus. When you spend time with Jesus Christ, you will also understand the authority that comes in the word. Not the authority of like, I've got three degrees, I'm a doctor so-and-so, I'm professor so-and-so. That's what we see today. I don't care how many titles you have on your name. Demonstrate the gospel in power. Because that's what people want to see. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. So let's go on. So now we're going to take a look, closer look into the realm of supernatural signs and wonders. And we're going to see at these different elements, we're going to look at specific list of signs and wonders in, in, in the signs and wonders presented in Mark 16, verse 17. So we're going to go through that again. We're going to see that he says they will cast out demons. So this is a sign of deliverance ministry. And we're going to go into that a little bit deeper now. We also see, we see that it says, signs, they shall speak with new tongue. So we're seeing that there is a sign of a new language being given to the believer that will accompany and follow those that believe Jesus Christ. They will take up serpents. So there was a sign of protection that follows the servants of God. Wherever we go, we are protected. As I've gone to nations that had Ebola, as I've gone to nations that have had Zika, and all of a sudden it says, no, don't go to that nation. And even to come back into this country, they would put you aside and go through a whole health check. So everyone was like, don't go there, don't go there. But if you go with the protection of Jesus Christ, and you have that knowledge, just like when I was going to South Africa, God showed me that Nelson Mandela was going to die by the end of that year in a dream. And then I knew that the xenophobia and also the racial tension was going to break out. So every time I was going back, I was like, oh, Lord, this is getting closer. And then I was there at the times it was breaking out. I was ca catching a bus from uh, Seduna uh, into uh, Johannesburg. And that weekend was when all the trouble happened. And I got there at night time. And we managed to get through because when God is with you, he protects you. And he said that to Paul. He said it in Acts 18. He says, go, don't worry. No one will harm you because those that are with me are more. Meaning there is always a remnant of those that God has to protect us so that the gospel can be preached. Hallelujah. So it says, they also drank. It says, and if they drink anything deadly... It will by no means hurt them. So that's another sign of protection. Okay, let's look at this one. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So there is a, a confidence that comes. All we need to do is lay the hands. The recovery is up to God. But according to Acts 4 verse 30, it says, And as you stretched out your hands to heal, that signs and wonders took place in your wonderful name. Hallelujah. It ain't my name. These aren't my hands. They're his hands. So all we have to do is lay the hands yes. and God will bring the healing. Hallelujah. So maybe this would be a good time for us to remind about the words that are found in Philippians 4.13. We can see, I can do what? All things through Christ who strengthens me. God is, God is affirming someone here today. Saying you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Not just the pastor. Not just the evangelist. Not just the apostle. Not just the prophet. But God is saying, and we can. Each person can do because we can do all things through Christ. And then according to Mark 9.23 says all things are possible to those who, to him who believes. Yes. Do you believe? 
When you start believing the God of the word and what he said he did, he will do, then you will start to see the manifestation of those things. And you keep believing until you start seeing them. Hallelujah. So if I'm going to impact life for eternity, I must not be satisfied until my witness brings people to the point where they have a powerful, personal encounter with God. Do you have that effect on the people in your workplace? They are waiting to see the demonstration and the power of God. They are wanting to eat from the fruit of your vine. Hallelujah. We are to be a walking feast that people can come and eat from us. They can eat joy. They can eat peace. They can eat all the fruits of the Holy Spirit through your life because you're bringing them something. And now you're going to demonstrate the power because you're one that walks in power. Hallelujah. So God wants us to walk in power. So all things are possible. Faith in God requires that the term impossible be viewed as inappropriate and obsolete. I don't want to hear that anymore. If you say it's impossible, I don't want to hear it. It's obsolete. That word doesn't even exist in our vocabulary. Hallelujah. We just go by faith. Hallelujah. So the Bible reveals that the spirit world of darkness is very real. So we're going to look at deliverance now. So it is not to be taken lightly, yet when dealing with Satan and his demonic hordes, believers that are instructed to do the willing, be willing to take action against the authority, realizing that in Christ, victory is assured. Let's look at this now. When we look at a tree, the outer rim of that tree is the branches. So the branches are fed by the trunk, isn't it? But the trunk is fed by the roots. So therefore, if the roots are bad, it will affect the whole tree. And so it is with deliverance ministry. Let me give you an illustration today. There are two women. They have passed through the same experience. Maybe you've passed through the same experience as someone else. But because of outcome, something different happened. They were both rejected by their husbands. So therefore, in that rejection, one who went to a church that refused to allow drinking of alcohol, and one went to a church that looked lightly upon that thing. So one turned to alcohol, while the other turned into overeating, right? So one of them had both had an addiction. But if you were to confront the addiction in those people, you would have to come to the root, which is rejection. See? Otherwise, it is the root that causes the problem for the rest. So most of the time, when we meet someone that has gone into prison, for instance, we see a young man that has come from uh, a home where there wasn't a father, so he wasn't affirmed. And then all of a sudden, because of that feeling of abandonment, then all of a sudden, this person turns to what? He turns to crime. He turns to trying to fit into society. So when we go into the prisons, we realize that we're dealing with abandonment. We're dealing with rejection. So when we get to the root cause of deliverance ministry, it will then be able to be a lot easier dealing with the problem that we see at hand. Because that's what demons do. They just come in and they come on top of each other. But there is a strong man within there that's controlling them. And most of the time, we find that unforgiveness, we find that rejection, we find that abandonment, we find that whatever that cause is, maybe it's abuse, whatever it is, is the cause of why other demons have come in. Then we also find that there are generational things that come into the line. Meaning that from your lineage, from your forefathers, that's why the Bible says, Exodus 20, Verse 3 says, God will visit our forefathers' sin to the third and to the fourth generation. Meaning, at a minimal, there are some things that have happened so far back that's affected the way of the character flaws that you see in your family. So if there's anger in your family, or if there's rage in your family, if we probably go back a few centuries, we'll find that maybe someone had got to the point of killing someone, or they did murder someone. So that's spirit now transfers onto the lineage that goes down the track. 
So when you go to pray with people, you preach the gospel, you see the healing, you see the deliverance, and then all of a sudden you need to now distinguish which one is it that you've got to deal with. Are you got to deal with the demon or you've got to deal with the issue which is the healing of the soul before so the demon doesn't come back into that place. So let's look at this. We'll go a little bit further. It says in 1 John 4, 4, it says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome him because he who is in you is greater than he that's in the world. Hallelujah. So that means that a born-again Christian, when they have Jesus inside of them, it is greater as he now, Jesus Christ, that lives in you than the devil that lives in this world. Right? And... So let's move on a little bit more. We go to 1 John 3, 7. And it says here, we're going to talk about what Jesus is saying, but what does the Bible say Jesus came to do? According to that, it says, He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For the purpose of the Son of Man and the Son of God was to be manifested that he would what? Destroy the works of Satan. That means that the purpose of Jesus Christ was to destroy the assignment of the devil that's been against each and every one of our lives. Hallelujah. So let's look at this. We're going to look at oppression. What is oppression? So oppression is the outward influence and attack of the enemy against people. Demonic forces may oppress or come against people in a variety of ways, and we're going to see, according to scriptures, how these attacks are oppress different people. So if we go and we see, according to Acts 10.38, it says that Jesus was anointed by the Father through the Holy Spirit to come to do what? He came, how healing, he, he came to bring healing all who were oppressed by the devil. So the purpose of Jesus was come to deliver those who are oppressed. Hallelujah. So let's look at this. So healing all, all that were oppressed. Healing is not only the release of pain and suffering from off of a person's life, but also the release of demonic oppression that usually accompanies those times of weakness within your life. Hallelujah. So healing also can be to bring oppression away from your life. Hallelujah. So there are many things that we see today. Depression, fear, anxiety, and so forth. All those lists, and the list goes on. A lot of those are rooted into oppression of the devil. And what did Jesus come to do? He came to set them free. And we see that according to the Bible, it says that when the lady was hunched over like this, it says that she couldn't even raise up her hands because that's what the devil does. He doesn't want you to worship him. But what did Jesus do? He spoke to the woman and saw her from a distance and said, Be loosened in the name of Jesus Christ. As soon as he said those words, this lady that had been walking around hunched over that couldn't even raise her hands or even look up, she was constantly looking back at her past and that's what it is in the spiritual realm. And then what happened? She raised up her hands and she was able to worship Jesus Christ because that's what he does. Now according to 2 Timothy 1.7, the Bible also says, now the Spirit expressively says that in the latter times, no, sorry, it says here, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and of a sound mind. So that spirit of fear is an oppressive attack of the devil. And each one of us, even as a child, when you are too scared to go outside because of the dark, and then as an adult, you still sleep with the lights on, or that there are things that you're afraid of. You're afraid of dogs. You're afraid of these things. And that spirit comes to what? It comes to attach itself to us to control our life that we will not walk in the freedom that Christ gave for us. But he came to set those captives free. Hallelujah. And that's what he does today. So according to 1 John 4 verses 1 and 2, it says, um, according to this, it was talking about you know, in this letter to Timothy, in chapter 4, it's saying, hey, be careful. Because there is a time coming when people will not be able to take sound doctrine. And what will happen? They will come and they will turn from the faith 
giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So another oppression that we are seeing even more today than ever before is the great falling away that we're seeing in the church today. And that great falling away is exactly what I'm talking about. We're not seeing those things. We're not seeing the word preached with authority and power. Yes. We're not seeing right. people being yes. healed and delivered in the church. Yes. That is the falling away. Yes. Because the devil knows yes. if he takes that gospel away, right. the people will still that's be right. oppressed coming that's in right. yes. and oppressed leaving. Yes. And that's why they feel good when they're that's there. Right. But as yes. soon as they leave, they're still fearful. Right. As soon as they leave, they're still in sexual sin. As soon as they leave, nothing changes because the gospel, when you have an encounter with it, it must produce change. Hallelujah. So let's look at this. So we see that the spirit of fear was a tormenting fear is another of Satan's weapons designed to discourage and defeat anyone whose mind is not fixed on the Lord. That's what we see today. Most of the people that you see that are, suffer with fear, if they don't know the Lord, it's such a terrible life that they have because they feel that there is no way out. There's no way of escape as soon as Jesus Christ comes into their life. Let's look at doctrines of devils. Scripture reveals that during the last days, Satan will release a host of lying spirits who jo whose job will be to somehow persuade God's people away from the truth of God's word. Now, let me just tell you one thing. That gospel of once saved, always saved is the biggest lie from the pit of hell. Right. And a host of demons have come out to spread that across right. the world. Because if you think you don't have to repent, you're already given yourself a legal right for a spirit to come into you. The Bible says to be full of the Holy Ghost. When you're not full of the Holy Spirit, mm. someone else will That's come right. and fill yes. you. Yes. You may feel... You have a false sense of security that you're all right. But deep down, your conscience is actually a little bit guilty about what you're doing. Until it gets to that point that just like an unbeliever, that you've actually told the Holy Spirit, no, I don't want to have anything to do with you. And so it was with Stephen when he spoke to the high priest, when he spoke to the Pharisees in Acts chapter 7, he says, and use... What have you been doing? You've been resisting. You've been resisting the Holy Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit comes to convict us of sin. That's why he was sent, to convict us of sin and unto righteousness and unto judgment. But now we see that they, they, they take the context of Romans 8 verse 1, and they always use the NIV translation. The NIV translation says this, says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But if you look at the King James Version, it says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus that don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Amen. See, if you take that out of context, you will say, hey, there is no condemnation. You can't judge me. But the Bible says, don't abuse the grace of God. The Bible also says, be careful we don't abuse the Spirit of grace. Therefore, the Spirit of grace is the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit's been given a title of holy because He is holy. That's why God said to us, we must be holy for your God is holy. Hallelujah. So, for us, we must understand these things. Now, according to Mark 1, we're going to look at this because we're going to look at possession. Now, possession is the ultimate controlling work of demons. Demons' possession is possible for those who do not have the Spirit of Christ in them and who open their lives up to the working of demonic spirits. So we can see that in the following scriptures that we're going to read. But let's talk about this. Can a Christian be oppressed? Yes, a Christian can be oppressed. Now, a demon cannot come into your spirit because that's where the Holy Spirit is. But we have three parts to us. We have the flesh, we have the soul, which is your character, which is your mind, which is your emotions, and we have the spirit man. Now, we gave that demonstration on Sunday where the whole topic was to walk in the spirit, wasn't it? And I gave that demonstration how the flesh communicates to the soul, the soul communicates to the spirit, 
And the spirit, now that has the Holy Spirit, rejects it if it is not righteous. It says that is not righteous. Then it communicates to the soul, and then the soul communicates to the flesh. But if the flesh continues to do it, then their flesh will convince the soul to say, hey, you know it's good. You know you feel good when you do that because the soul is all about emotions. And that's what we do. We find that we have Christians that have addictions. We have Christians that are fearful. We have Christians that are oppressed, that are anxiety, that have depression, that have lust issues, whatever it is, because their flesh is communicating with their soul and the soul's not taking the advice from the spirit and the flesh is not hindering it. That's why we have to fast and pray. When you fast, you subject the flesh to come under the will of the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh when you walk in the spirit hallelujah when you're in the spirit and you fast it is food for the soul but when you eat when you should be fasting it is poison to the soul that's why when you keep on eating and eating and eating you're building up the flesh man but your spirit man is becoming weak that's why he says that when i go they will fast so fasting is so vital also for deliverance. The Bible says that some only come out through prayer and fasting. So fasting, we must subject the flesh so that it becomes the weaker person. Otherwise, the spirit man will dry up. And if you, the, 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 the soul and the, the flesh are not communicating the right stuff, the thing will feel oppressed. And that's what happened. A demon will come and oppress the spirit man, like putting a cup over the spirit man. And the emotions or the soul has all the attachments of the demonic spirit. So if it's a spirit of fear, a spirit of fear will come and attach itself to you. So every time you feel fear or you come across a certain situation and you feel like, why am I scared now? I shouldn't be scared. Because it is the demon hiding behind that very characteristic. That's why when you get angry and all of a sudden there's no point of return, as you know, you feel like that and you say, oh, I've just said those things. And you want to say sorry straight after, but you've already done the damage because you had no self-control. That's why one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is self-control. So do we have self-control when we're put into a situation where there's lust? Do we have self-control when we're put into a situation when anxiety starts to have its way? Do we have self-control when we're in a situation where we are addicted to drugs, food, um, alcohol, smoking, whatever it is? We can be addicted to different things. And uh, do we have that self-control? And that's what it is. So the demon can come and afflict itself, hide behind your emotions and your soul. But then also a demon can come and afflict your flesh and bring sickness, isn't it? We know that. So even an unbeliever can get sick, just as Christians can get sick that we see today. But in the church of God, the sickness should be eliminated. It shouldn't be tolerated. But today in the church, we see demons are tol tolerated. Sickness is tolerated because no one is willing to get on their knees and meditate on the scriptures and say, God, did you mean what you really said in your word? Or was that just for before? And that's what we're seeing today in many Bible colleges. They will say, oh, yes, God did those things before because that's what he did to establish the church. He doesn't need to do that now. That is a lie from the pit of hell. We have institutions. We have dead churches that are, are controlled by man and the spirit of God. The people that they have put into those positions in the priesthood are appointed by man and not by God. And that's what we see today in the church. So for us, we must be free from oppression. But let's look at these examples of oppression. According to Mark 1, verse 23 to 27, we can see here that this is just after Jesus preached a wonderful gospel with authority. Now there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him and saying, Be quiet, come out of him. Then all of a sudden, and when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Now, when you're doing deliverance ministry, 
Most pastors today, oh, I don't like deliverance ministry. Even in uh, Johannesburg, this one guy says, I don't like deliverance ministry, I don't want vomit on my carpet. They don't understand that these things must convulse to come out of the person. That's a requirement. So if you're more worried about your lovely carpet, then you're in the wrong business because preaching the gospel will have convulsing and vomiting of spirits coming out of people. As much as you want to say it's not there, we can clearly see it's here in Scripture. Hallelujah. And when you want to be like Jesus, you're going to walk like Jesus. We're going to see the same things as Jesus. So it came out of him. Then they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even unclean spirits, and they obey him. Hallelujah. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Let me tell you one thing. When Jesus came, he came with authority. They were astonished. The second thing they're astonished by was deliverance ministry. Where did deliverance ministry start? It started in the house of God. Hallelujah. And so it is today. It didn't start with the prostitutes at the prostitute parlor. It didn't start with those in the hotels and the pubs or the bars. It started in the house of God. They were astonished because this religious person would come to church every Sunday, but it came under a radar that wasn't detected because the word of God was not preached with authority. But on that day, it was preached with authority and the demon came out and says, hey, you've exposed us. How did he expose him? With the word of God. When we preach the word of God, it will expose demons and they must flee through the authority of Jesus Christ. But why was that such a strange thing? Well, this is a new doctrine. And so we see it today. Oh, I don't believe in generational curses. I don't believe in deliverance. I don't believe in that doctrine. It's not true. No, it is true. It was there at the beginning and it brought such an excitement because they hadn't seen it before. The deliverance ministry, in its essence, started more with Jesus Christ. We see David, he played the harp and it controlled the demon that was within King Saul. But it wasn't delivered. But all of a sudden now, they're seeing an authority being preached with the word, being demonstrated, casting out demons. They are shocked. But, the, but what happened is the news went afar. And everyone said, wow, this authority is something that we haven't seen before. And so it is in the church, in the house of God as I travel the nations. And I'm seeing the demons being cast out of pastors themselves. Something's wrong in the house of God. So one must meditate and pray and say, God, what needs to change? So let's go on a little bit further. According to Mark 1, 32 to 34, we see another instance. Now I'm going to read from uh, verse 30 because we see, But Simon's, wife, uh, but Simon's wife's mother and, uh, lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand, lift her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. So at evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick, and those who were demon-possessed. So there were, he dealt with the spirit of infirmity because of oppression in the mother-in-law of Peter. But now he's dealing with those who were possessed, meaning they weren't believers. They didn't receive God. They were possessed. They were controlled by these demonic spirits. And it says here, they brought all of those to him who were demon possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door, meaning, oh, you know, this created such a fame. Everyone wanted to come and see. And so it is. When you go to some places, you start doing deliverance ministry, you will get a crowd very quickly. Hallelujah. Because people want to come and see what's going on. What's all that What's all that shenanigans going on? Hallelujah. Probably here, they will ring up the nut house to come and take you in a straitjacket. Hallelujah. Not knowing that it's actually a demonic spirit that needs to be dealt with. Or we see it as, you know, they'll say, oh, that person's just having an epileptic fit. There's always a science... Uh, terminology given to something that is sometimes spiritual. So it says here, and when he healed many who were sick, 
with various diseases and cast out many demons and he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him now to be honest with you i don't like to speak to too many demons i like to get them out as quick as possible but sometimes to get their name it 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 removes the authority that the demon has upon the person so sometimes knowing the name can weaken the demon so the, we know that uh, deliverance is sometimes a process it's not something that can just happen sometimes overnight but some people get delivered very quickly some people it's a process depending on what the situation is that we're dealing with with each case so each person is different as we saw with the two ladies even though the root was uh, rejection they both had a different addiction didn't they and so it is two people going through the same thing will be affected even differently one might have an addiction one might go and look for another addiction maybe sexual sin maybe with her husband rejects her she then becomes unfaithful to sleep with other men because the spirit was different for each person to come and the assignment was different okay so let's look at this let's look at the last example in mark 1 38 39 it says uh, but he said to them let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. And he was preaching in their synagogue throughout all of Galilee and casting out demons. Hallelujah. Then I, so that's what his will was. He was there for a purpose to preach the gospel, to heal the sick, and to cast out devils. Hallelujah. So when we look at Ephesians 6, verse 10, we can see clearly now, we can see that God is now looking at the hierarchy that is within the demonic realm. So that is that the fallen angels, we have Lucifer at the top, then we have the archangels, we have those that are principalities, those in high positions, and we have those going down to the smaller minion demons that do the medial stuff. There are demons that control regions, there's con demons that control areas. Let me give you an example. You can be on a plane and you feel sick in that particular city but as soon as that plane lifts off and you get beyond that area all of a sudden you start to feel good because that oppression that sickness whatever it was that was in that region was 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 bringing oppression upon the saints so every city that i go into there is a hindering force there is an oppressing force there is a, a strong man within those places that tries to what hinder the work of God hinder the Christian from being effective so that's why in some places you can sense there is a spirit here you go into a nightclub you don't have to be there long if you stay there long enough that seducing spirit of that nightclub will come and seduce you and you will compromise in your Christian walk because there were people that I knew in the early days they said hey we're going to go to the nightclubs we're going to start to evangelize these people the very people that were trying to evangelize was the very spirit that came and they all fell in sexual sin because they were trying to do you know even other people that i know that were trying to minister to prostitutes in different countries because they weren't strong in the spirit they were being in places where the spirit was very strong and if your spirit is not strong then you've got to keep away from those places otherwise they will oppress you they will affect you right so you've got to be very careful. We can do another teaching about this uh, later on. But let's look at this. Ephesians 6, verse 10. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We're dealing with spiritual forces. And every time we preach the gospel, we are shaking the fortresses. We are shaking the kingdom of darkness upon this world. And that's why when we preach the gospel, it will be like we're turning the world upside down. Because that's what we're doing. We're turning the world within each person upside down that they feel conscious of the sin that's in their life that they want to repent and come back to Jesus Christ hallelujah 
So we can see according to uh, Mark 16, 17, it says people of faith can put the devil on the run. Did you know that? People of faith can put the devil on the run. Hallelujah. Now, I don't know if maybe he's been crouching at your door. Maybe he's been tormenting you. Maybe he's been oppressing you. Maybe he's been possessing you. Who knows? But we, with authority, with people of faith, can put the devil on the run. <laughs> so it says here, And these signs will follow them who believe in my name. They will cast out devils. They will cast out demons. So, like Christ, we have been given the mandate and the power to what? To set the captives free. That means Corey has been given the same authority. That means Fifi. That means Ronald. That means every single person listening to the voice of this tongue now knows the truth. They have been given the mandate. And that mandate is of Christ yes. and is to walk in the power to set the captives free. And those that have faith will make the devil go on the run. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let's look at this. Let's look at healing. So Luke 17 verse 14. Before we turn to that, healing can be instant. And healing can be progressive. How do I know that? Because I go to the scripture. Hallelujah. Everything we say must match up with the word of God. Otherwise, it becomes what Pastor Robert said, or Pastor so-and-so said, or Apostle so-and-so. No, no, no. What the word of God says is what we must stand upon. So here we see in progressive healing, Luke 17, 14, it says, When he saw them, he said, Go show yourself to the priests. And look at this. And as they went, they were cleansed. Do you see the progressiveness? As they went on their way, they were healed. But unfortunately, only one came back to testify, right? And that's what we see in the house of God today too. Now we don't know what happens. Maybe sometimes as Jesus warned the woman, says, be careful lest that thing come back seven times worse. You've got to be careful. When we maintain our healing, maintain our deliverance, you must keep a clean vessel. Otherwise, those demons will come back because they're looking. They go to dry places. They don't find comfort. They come back seeing the clean vessel. And then they will reestablish themselves with you, even through your dreams. So sometimes when you feel you've been cast out, the demon's cast out, then all of a sudden, just after a while, you're free. And then all of a sudden, you're starting to get dreams again. So how did those dreams come? Because demons will try to come to reestablish former covenants through dreams. And once you start believing those dreams and start having a bad confession, then all of a sudden those things have come back seven times worse. Because it says once it's done that trick on you, it goes and finds seven that are worse, that are stronger to come and possess you. And that is why when people get delivered or get set free, come into the presence of the Lord, when they backslide, it's nearly impossible for them to come back. There are people that I know that were touched by God, that were healed by God, that were delivered by God. But because they backslid, those demons came back seven times worse. And that devil will never want you to come back under the presence of God again. So what does he do? They will shut all your phone calls. They will just communicate themselves from you because they know the devil knows it to be around you. That's where the open heaven is. When there's an open heaven upon your life and you're walking in faith, the devil will never allow that person to come back again if he can. So that's why we must maintain it. Let's look at this progressive healing. In Mark 8, verses 22 to 25, I won't read the whole chapter, but it talks about the blind man. And this particular blind man, he was what? Jesus touched him a second time. Because the first time he started to see trees of men. Meaning it was a progressive healing. It was a progressive healing. So he prays for the blind man twice. So in the midst of whatever physical affliction that we may ever face in our life, we must learn from these examples in Scripture by kneeling in prayer, standing in faith, 
and walking in obedience. So if you're not sure, you're saying, God, why haven't I received my healing? Get on your knees and say, God, I know you did it progressively in these two examples. I don't understand why, but God, I know when I'm on my knees. I know when I'm in faith. I know when I'm in prayer and walking in obedience. You will come and bring your healing at your appointed time. So you've got to question God. You've got to come back to Him. So the subject of divine healing comes to the forefront as another sign and a mark of the ministry of believers. So as we saw in the last lesson, we saw the, the, the deliverance uh, and all the different things that were t- taking place. But touching lives of everyone, uh, you know, as we saw with Paul, he touched a lot of lives on the, life, uh, on the island of Malta. But since Jesus is saying yesterday, today and forever, there should be no doubt is still he is in the healing business and he's also called us to be in the healing business also. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So that means you, Corey. So the healing ministry of Christ was prophesied by Isaiah in Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 5. Now I'm just going to go straight to verse 5. It says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our what iniquities. And the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. So Isaiah, he prophesied a healing ministry. The same Isaiah prophesied the same ministry in Isaiah 61, where he says, I've come to give good news, to bring healing to the sick, to tell the the poor that they are rich, the oppressed that they are free. He came with a healing ministry. So the healing ministry can be twofold. It can be for the soul, and it can also be for the body. So we need to understand the two different aspects of it. So when we look here, we see in Matthew 4, 23, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases. Hallelujah. And also in Matthew 9, 35, it says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and the villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease. Hallelujah. So he went around eliminating sickness. He didn't come to tolerate sickness. He didn't come to give you a band-aid. He didn't come to give you a Panadol or a Disprin. He came to eliminate sickness as he came to terminate demonic strongholds on people's lives. Hallelujah. So that same power he's given to each of us. So we can see here, according to Acts 5, Uh, verses 15 to 16 well we can go from verse 12 it says through the hands of the apostles many signs and wonders were done so through the hands that means through your hands there is another book you know there is a book of remembrance that's been written about all of your lives right now and all the things you do for God It says, through the hands of Pastor Robert, he laid the hands on the sick in the name of Jesus. They were healed and they all delivered and set free. Hallelujah. They will declare these stories. We will go to hear these things. Hallelujah. I'm looking forward to that day. To find out, you know, to sit with the Apostle Paul, to sit with all these people, just to ask them the stories. It will all be about glorifying Jesus Christ, who's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. We won't be able to say, well, Paul, why did you do it in the out your days and we didn't do it in ours? No. We would say, we did it too. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, that's what I think the church would be asking that question. Well, why don't we walk in that power? Because you haven't believed that you could. Right. Something's gone wrong. So if we go from Acts 5, verse 15 to 16, it says, So that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on them, as a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were what? They were all healed. So multitudes came out of the cities. Because of the ministry of divine healing, working in and through the disciples, multitudes of people came to encounter God from communities all around Jerusalem. Imagine, people will come from afar. If there is just one healing that takes place, people will come. They don't care if it's a small house. They want healing. There is a lot of sick people. They need the power of God demonstrated that they may receive that power. 
Trust me, they will bypass all the mega churches just to come to the place where they know they're going to receive the healing, where they know they're going to receive the good things. So don't, don't be swayed by the wrong things. We can see here, healed everyone. At times it appeared that when people would gather to encounter the power of God working through the Lord's disciples, everyone who came ill went home well. Hallelujah. They had a faith. They had a knowing, hey, God's moving over there. I need to go there. I want to receive that healing. Hallelujah. So the Bible says here, obviously in James 5, verse 13 to 15, it says, uh, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. If anyone is among you sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of the faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Hallelujah. That's the promise. Go out, anoint the sick, and the Lord himself will raise him up. Hallelujah. So God is here to produce this. So we can also see, uh, according to Acts 9, 33 to 35, it says, For he found a certain man named Anet, uh, Aeneas, uh, who had been um, beridden eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Arise, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. So all who dwelt in Lydia and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. So we can see here that all turned to the Lord. So this single act of healing of one name, one name Aeneas, was so powerful, the entire population of two communities accepted the gospel message. Hallelujah. That's what we can see in some places. You go to very remote places of India, very remote places of Africa. When you bring one healing, and especially if there is a contest between a, a witch doctor or some demonic stuff going on there, and you start to see those forces come down, many people come to the Lord. Because many people were consulting those, even people in churches, because the churches they go to doesn't have the demonstration of power. People want supernatural healing. So if they're not going to get it from the church, they will more likely go to another place. So it is in the church. People go into New Age, Reiki, Yoga, all these Eastern meditation things, looking and searching for power, not seeing that God is a God that works. So to think God's people can literally bring relief to the suffering masses of this world is an absolute incredible thing in itself. Hallelujah. So I think I'm just going to stop there. So Lord, I just thank you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are the God that works miracles. You are the God that works miraculous powers. You're the same God yesterday, today, and forever in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ Lord I pray right now through the power of the Holy Spirit as your word is being preached there are those that are viewing there are those that are watching that have been sick that need healing there are those that have been oppressed that need freedom Lord I thank you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ Jesus Christ became a curse on the cross that he would defeat all the curses within our lives. Heavenly Father, I thank you in the name of our Lord Jesus. Where anyone's name or photo or any of their belongings has been placed yes. on any unholy altar, yes. no matter how far back the generations, we pray that they'll be destroyed by fire in the name of Jesus Christ. You would uproot every legal right. You would uproot every reason of oppression within people's lives. Lord, we declare today, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You said, Lord, in your name, you will set the captives free. In the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus will set the captives free to deliver the oppressed. In the name of Jesus, we declare today that you will bring freedom to all those that are listening right now that need that freedom. Let them receive it today in the name of our Lord Jesus. I just want you to stand up if you can. Thank you, Jesus. We're just going to come back to the Lord. We're going to ask Him to come into our hearts.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So if you're watching or listening right now, I just want you to shut your eyes. Just close your eyes right now. God is also speaking to you. You know, he, He's saying that even through you, I'll do things. You know, like Christ, we have been given the mandate and the power to set the captives free. You know, the impact that we, we're going to have, we're also going to have on many, many people to bring that impact. So the expectations are high and the mandate is clear. Men and women of faith are people of action. And you're even going to make the devil run. He's going to flee. He's going to flee from us. Because greater is he that lives in us than he that lives in the world. But if you are here today and the Lord is convicting you of any sin, any word or thought or deed that's been done today or over this last week that you know that it's not pleasing to God, we're going to have this opportunity to come back to the Lord. We're going to repeat this, we're going to repeat this prayer right now. In the name of Jesus, just declare this. Heavenly Father, this night we repent of all of our sin. Wash us with the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. We welcome the gift of your Son, Jesus, into our hearts as our Lord, as our God, and as our personal Savior. And from today, it's a new beginning. Our past is forgiven. Today we choose to forgive those that have offended us or those actions that others have done. As you forgive us, we forgive them. Today, it's a new beginning. We are born again. Father, send the promise of the gift of your Son, the Holy Spirit, into our lives to empower us, to heal us, to deliver us, to set us free. We don't want to be ordinary Christians. We want to walk in spirit, walk in power, walk in authority that Jesus gave us. We receive it. We believe it today in the name of Jesus. Okay, just keep your hands up. So Heavenly Father, I thank you in the name of our Lord Jesus as the anointing of the Holy Spirit is in this place right now. As the Holy Spirit will come and fill us and touch our hearts right now in the name of our Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, Send your anointing right now. Send your anointing. Send your fire. Send your glory right now. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. 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 Holy Spirit, you are welcome now. You are welcome now. You are welcome now. Just change the song to a song to break every chain. Break every chain or any song that you find. If you can pray in the spirit, I want you to pray in the spirit right now. Just ask the Lord to deliver you. Ask the Lord to set you free today. Ask the Lord that it is now time. It is now time. God is doing a new thing. God is doing a new thing. He's going to pull us out. He's going to pull us out. He's going to pull us out. He's going to pull at us, no matter what you're going through. God is going to do a new thing today. He is a God that comes to eliminate sickness. He comes to terminate a silence of the devil. That's what he does. 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 I thank you, Lord Jesus. I give you all the praise. 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 I give you all the praise right now. In the name of Jesus.